Hey folks, it's your friends at SCTV9, and we're here this August to take you on a historic tour of Situate. Today, we're here with Yvonne from the Situate Historical Society to bring you on an exclusive tour of the Man House. But don't just trust the version you see from your living room. Come down and get a great look of it yourself. You won't regret it. This is a picture of Percy, that, uh, the last summer of his life, as you can see. He is out in his fields, and he died in his uh, early 90s, in about 1969. This is a very famous person on the, in the Man House story. It's Zebra, commonly called Zebe. Uh, she was Mr. Man's horse, and we never really can pinpoint where he got her, but our assumption is that since she had been a police horse in the um, Blue Hills all her life, that would have been her life career, um, they probably may have advertised her and said, is there someone who can give her a home? As the Pete sheriff in Plymouth has just given a lot of the retired release really horses their home. She was of use to people, but she was not a farm horse. She learned how to work in the fields, but her main thrill was to stand out looking over that wall of the fence waiting for kids who always have good things in their pockets or anybody else that was coming along to talk to and about everybody and she's quite a, quite a famous character and such what about everybody in town at that time knew her and uh, where they, you speak to people now that oh yeah I remember I was up there sometimes she was frisky she was brought home by the police from Greenbush one time when she took a little jaunt for herself but she was a great character on this particular story. She lived in a three-sided barn for four years after Mr. Mann died and was cared for by a couple of girls who lived on Ridge, one on Ridge Hill and one on Cedar Crest. They came and fed her and brought her water at least twice a day. And, uh, and she had a very, very happy retirement. She died on the property, and her grave is down in the other field. The girls sent money home to have a gravestone made for her, so you can see Zebbie and tells her history. This is Mr. Mann's car, the remnants of which are out in the yard there. You may have already seen them. Uh, this is not his car. It's just a, a picture that would be the era and the type of car that he had. He, um, Mr. Mann had a definite mind of his own. He, um, he was stopped by the police and not doing anything to him wrong. They wanted, just wanted to check his registration and his license, uh, both of which were out of date. And they explained to him very nicely that you had to renew these. And Mr. Mann could not buy that philosophy at all. If you bought something once and you paid for it, that was it. And that was what he was doing and what he would continue to do. And with that, he drove away and drove the car in the yard, threw the keys somewhere, never been found, and it's been there ever since. There's not much left of it, but there's, because there's a tree growing up through the engine, but it uh, shows the kind of um, um, personality Mr. Mann had. He was uh, very much a Renaissance man. He was a farmer, but if you'll notice, when you... Uh, and to come into this room, as I say, very, he very clever person. He went to the auction at the Lawson estate when the everything that Tom Lawson had was being auctioned off, and he looked at that case, and without even measuring it, he said, I think it'll fit, and I think it does. <laughs> Over here we have a picture of Thomas Mann, who was the, he restored this house, and came back here to uh, stay for the rest of his life. He had never married, and he married when he was uh, in his 70s. And he had the three children, and he had a, a, an older boy who passed away from a childhood disease. And then there was Ilda, and then there was Percy. And uh, per, neither Percy or, or, nor Ilda married. There were no, uh, well, Percy did marry, but he had no children. and. Uh, so when Percy died, the house went to his um, nieces who lived in Cohasset, 
and they in turn uh, gave the house to the town and the Historical Society restored it. It needed a lot of work and uh, it uh, still, we have put in some basic heating for, because of the artifacts and we have some electricity, but Percy had neither, nor did he have water or uh, any other amenities and he lived here uh, without them into the 50s. We'll go around the corner now into the room that is the standard pattern for a for a cape house, basically, of this era. The two parlors and then the um, keeping room, family room we call it now, and also dining room. It was every room you could imagine. Uh, over the mantel is a picture of, of, of Percy, which he I've um, been told really disliked mainly because he was dressed up. He wasn't really very happy when he was uh, in full regalia. He liked being a farmer. Um, we have some interesting things in the house that weren't necessarily belong to Percy. When you um, when you have a central place, you find that you have many things returned to it by members and extended members of the family that they want kept and they don't really know what to do with them. So that's one reason that the uh, nieces uh, call this the Man Farmhouse and Museum. And one of the pieces that came back to us from a Man family was this beautiful Tiger Luster picture. Tiger lust, uh, Luster is very unusual in itself, but this is a particularly fine example of it. And we have uh, some other modern pestle from the very early 18th century and uh, we have some mannequins that uh, uh, she's very interesting. The, her dress is a wedding dress. There were basically no white wedding dresses before 1900. This bride, who was an ancestor of Ilda's, uh, was, ma was married, or this dress was used in 1853. The material came from Scotland from her aunt, and as you can see, all the stitching, we remind you that most all of this was done by hand, and uh, the material is just as strong and sturdy as it was the day it was made, I think. And so she is our bride. This uh, charming lady here, who has a tendency to frighten people when they first see her, but actually she's very mellow, and I think she's probably dressed, as many women did, for a special occasion, or it could be for church, could be for a funeral, but many of the women wore black as the, as the, get, uh, the real dress-up dress. The brides didn't need a white wedding dress. That what they needed was a good working clothes and one best dress. Um, you just, you look around these old houses and it verifies that comment because very seldom do you find a closet. And any of you who have an old house know that that's one of the problems with, with an old house, lack of closets. Uh, this is a, a gift from another man, uh, man family. It is, a, uh, it is a lamp. It is a banquet lamp, it was called. It has an onyx base here and beautifully, really beautifully uh, uh, design, uh, painted globe. And that was uh, uh, in the Van family, according to the donor, for three generations. This is a picture of a man family person. And then we go to the room that almost every cape had, some kind of a extra room. And it, this one's called, it can, sometimes they're called the morning and dying rooms because um, they were where the old people were usually slept and the babies were kept until they got to a fairly independent size. And that is because, of course, it was the next warmest room in the house next to the fireplace. And uh, so that was what was 
uh, what it was used for. If it weren't used for that, they used it for storage of uh, crops or vegetables or whatever they had. But there's very often this extra room on, on a cape house. In this room, which was Zilda's bedroom, the, on the bed is a, is a quilt, but it's not connected to the Mann family. Back in the bicentennial, they had a project in the Situate schools of teaching the fourth grade quilting. And so fourth grade made this, excuse me just a minute, made this quilt, and it has a little bit of everything, things from Situate, things from the Liberty Bell, and uh, it was done at Cushing School, and when the children come through here in the spring, Cushing is very proud of it. Upstairs we have one that was made by Hatherley, so we kind of covered everybody. Now we go into this second parlor, which is common in this era of the cave, and we kind of made it into an example of spinning wheels. Um, we have the big spinning wheel, which was called a walking wheel, uh, because the person who did it, or was assigned to the job, the household job, was usually a young female, good and strong, because she started and her job was to, and I don't know anything about how to spin, but anyway, she had to walk back and forth all day long, and it was a very tedious, and it needed a very strong person to do it. Interestingly enough, the word spinster came from this because that's what the person who used this wheel was called, uh, rather interestingly. The second spinning wheel would be this sit-down wheel, which was used by the older members of the family. And this is a hand loom, and it's set up to make some material. And um, I think that uh, Percy's mother and Aunt Polly, who lived in this room, had got a little pattern started here, and uh, they would sit at a table and, uh, and, and uh, weave this material, whatever they were making, as a kind of a, as kind of a social thing almost. This is a very beautiful clock. It has uh, pictures of two man ladies on it painted in reverse, and uh, if you can make them out here, uh, the glass broke and someone, we don't know who, uh, redid the pictures on the clock, and uh, it is a, around an 18, early 1800s clock. Now this upstairs is sort of a it's kind of uh, an opportunity, I guess, to show the kind of work that many of the people of Percy's time did. You know, if you're a farmer and the other half of the town seemed to be Irish sea mosses, uh, you don't work in the winter. And so, you know, you have to, you have to be skilled enough to have some other occupation. So this is a, a whole brother since we don't know much about sail making, we're, we haven't got it perhaps set up in, in, a, in any kind of really organized way. But these are the, the materials and the tools of sail making in here because that's what was one a good uh, part-time occupation. If you want to see the difference between sails then and sails now, lifting one of those compared to the lightweight ones they have now. I don't know how they ever got the needles or whatever through them, to tell you the truth. This is another bedroom, supposedly Percy's upstairs bedroom, although my understanding is he slept over there under that window because the east wind came in there. And, uh, and this is a very good example of it, uh, the old-fashioned sleeping bed. This bed is the rope bed, and the mattress is basically just what it is now. It's a big piece of cloth, and it could be filled with seaweed, it could be filled with hay, it could be filled with whatever your locale had to offer, and uh, that was the bed. Um, and it was, I don't know, uh, I wouldn't say it was 
in the Tempur-Pedic class at all. Now the ropes had a tendency to get stretched and and uh, loosened, and of course the bed sagged. So you'll find in most of these bed posts of these old beds a hole, and it had a, 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 like a key in it, and you would put the key in and turn it, and it would tighten the ropes up. And uh, hence came the say, saying, sleep tight, <laughs> so they say. All right, over here we have the inevitable cradle, which uh, has been important for what it fit for us. He didn't have a cradle. And uh, this is the very latest form of indoor plumbing. And it's, uh, it, was, it was probably quite sensational by the time. And it has a, a there. That's nice. And what the grade is for. Uh, and then this is a big container that you probably put water or something in. But considering that Percy's water was in a well way out in the backyard, it was probably quite a, uh, an operation. So this is a, it's really a, quite a nice, a nice uh, spaced room, but of course, there again, you had minimal use of it because it was so cold up here. And this was found when they were kind of redoing the house. Somebody saw a shaft of light you know, coming down from up here, no electricity, but something was coming down, and they investigated and found it. So it makes a, it makes a very good story, and I think it's plausible. If you think about the, what the uh, topography of Third Cliff was, and, and the uh, man's own land all the way down almost to Third Cliff. So, you know, it's kind of natural. <laughs> so there you have it. This pirate story of the man house. This this was the type of thing they had for games, patterns. Uh. Ready, where you see it, and all these sticks, and you were supposed to make baskets and things out of them. <laughs> they must have geniuses. I I you know I mean this is not what I'd call fun, but uh, some of them are some of them are kind of fun. Yeah, school bells and all kinds of things. Oh, there's a load of stories about Percy, and, and uh, there's a woman down the street uh, whose daughter was one of the ones that took care of Zebra all those years, and uh, she's 98 years old. She's, she's quite a person, and she knew Percy very, very well. Percy, you know, froze to death out in that little, where that apartment is. That was a little L, and that's what he used for a winter kitchen. He froze to death out there, and you know, when you think of it, he was elderly, and I, he probably wasn't in the best of health. It was winter, and when you have no heat, and you've got to get out to a barn to get wood for the stove and such, you know. But uh, anyway, but that's that was his end. Yeah, he used to wear it downtown, and uh, what I tell adults about Percy's, you know, stubbornness or steadfastness, you could say, and about the car and everything, but there's a man who lives on the other side of the uh, graveyard over there, and he knew Percy, and he says uh, he'd see Percy after he threw the keys away, of course, then he had to go downtown and do his shopping, and he'd, ha he'd, have, he'd be coming up, you know, with these big bags of shopping, and, and the fellow over there near the Jenkins School would say, hey, Percy, you want to ride? And he'd say, yeah, that'd be great. So sometimes stubbornness isn't the best thing in the world.